Kevin Davis, editor of BioIT World, back at Exploring Next Generation Sequencing here in Providence, the CHI conference that's going on behind me. I'm joined by John Milton, Vice President of Research at Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Welcome, John. Thank you. You're always at these meetings, it seems, but you're never actually on the podium giving a talk. So when's that going to change? Uh, it's going to change pretty soon. We're obviously, uh, because of our uh, closeness to Illumina, uh, we have to be careful about what public statements we make. Uh, because that could potentially affect their share price. But uh, when we do release sequence data, we'll take it through the, the genome centers first, such as Sanger, uh, in the same way as we did at Selexa. Okay, so let me go back a little bit, or let us go back a little bit, and just sort of uh, explain that connection. And of course, uh, uh, speaking of Illumina, you were one of the key executives, key researchers at Selexa, the British company that Illumina bought. So why don't you just in 30 seconds or something. Just take me back through sort of the uh, the, the highlights of your time at uh, Selexa. Okay, so I joined Selexa in 2001, where it was a small tech company just spun out of uh, Cambridge University. Um, there was about 15 of us, and I joined as the head of chemistry. Uh, we built up a big R&D center at Chesterford, which is just south of Cambridge, uh, made up of uh, a large number of chemists, molecular biologists, uh, people working on chip surfaces, enzymologists, but also engineers, optical physicists, and also informaticians, um, su such as people as Clive Brown, who you know. Um, and then over the next two, three years, we developed the sequencing chemistry that was ultimately to become part of the Genome Analyzer platform. And then we sold that in uh, 2006, 2007 to Illumina for $650 million. And that was my exit at that point, having sort of delivered the chemistry side. So you started off doing single molecule sequencing and of course there are companies now like Helicoast that are having some success with single molecule sequencing. I mean, I'm sure you don't have any regrets about moving away from that, which was done for important reasons uh, going back a few years, but how, does it, how, does, how do you feel actually seeing some single molecule methods actually now uh, being commercialized and having success? I'm actually very pleased that Helicoast have managed to bring the technology to fruition. It's very, very challenging to do single molecule optical sequencing, and I always believed it was possible, but I think in the short term, to get to the marketplace quickly uh, was something that customers wanted and that was easy to use in a sort of sensible sized instrument. I think to go to sort of clustered uh, sequencing was, was a more sensible approach at the time. But I'm, I'm very pleased that Helicos have, 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 have you know, finally made it. Uh, just to go back to Selexa and its acquisition by Illumina, of course, Illumina uh, genome analyzers have become uh, you know, uh, key uh, instruments at the major genome centers, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, of course, the Broad Institute, Beijing Genomics Institute, and others, uh, producing the large majority of the human genome or genome sequence that's been deposited in the archives so far. Can you put a, can you quantitate or put some sort of figure on the amount of sequence that is out there now in the public domain that, you know, is partly or directly your, your, your the, the generator of the technology of? So, a rough estimate and this is from conversations between myself and Clive Brown, who's our VP of informatics, we think somewhere between 85 and 90% of all DNA sequence ever produced has been done on the genome analyzer. Uh, we think there's reasonably accurate numbers. Right. And, and I think about 90% of that has been done in the last year. So the acceleration in data output is, is just phenomenal. So after the Illumina uh, acquisition of Selexa, you took a little bit of time out and did some venture capital work and other things. And then uh, what made you come back into the sequencing mold? You'd had such success the first time. It's hard to catch lightning in a bottle twice. Right. So once the, the sort of the Selexa technology was out there, there was no obvious next gen technology to work on. But it was obvious that with all the sequence data that was going to be produced, um, somebody had to figure out what to do with that data. What did it mean medically? And so I started to look around at, at, at you know, what, what were the companies that were looking to raise capital to make use of that data? You know, do you want to dig for gold or do you want to sell the space? And after I'd been, I'd been working in the venture capital community for about six or nine months, uh, Oxford Nanopore came out of stealth mode and approached me directly to head up their uh, chemistry and R&D effort. So tell us about Nanopore sequencing briefly. What's a Nanopore and why, is it, why does it hold so much potential for DNA sequencing applications? Okay, so nanopore sequencing is a complete step change from anything that we see currently in that uh, we really eliminate all the optics from the sequencing system. So eliminate the lasers, eliminate the cameras, eliminate everything to do with light, photo damage of DNA, abbreviated read length errors, etc. To be able to move to a, a very small system, uh, the only real way you can do that is to move from photon-based sequencing to electron-based sequencing, so electrical readouts. Um, things that can be miniaturized, make, make use of all the advances in, in chip manufacturing in the electronics industry, and also using the sort of nanopores that exist in nature. So 
the starting point, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of building blocks that nature provides, uh, and bits of our own technology, you know, built by humans that we can put together and, and really get a head start in nanopore sequence. So you're using a bacterial protein, alpha hemolysin protein, as a, it's a naturally occurring uh, nanopore. What's the advantage of that versus synthetic okay. uh, or artificial nanopores? It's, okay, so what we actually use for the sequencing is not quite the natural version of hemolysin. We take the, the alpha hemolysin as the starting point. Uh, that's, a, that's a reasonably well characterized protein. X-ray structures are available. But we then heavily engineer that protein uh, to add special bits of chemistry that allow us to make accurate base calling to actually attach other bits of molecular machinery to build a, a larger piece of molecular machinery. So uh, Oxford was involved, uh, Hagen Bailey was the senior author of a paper in Nature Nanotechnology earlier this year that impressed a lot of people, a lot of observers, uh, for showing that you could discriminate between not only the four naturally occurring bases of DNA but also methylated uh, cytosines as well. Tell us just a little bit about what you did to achieve that. Okay, so in order to do that, you need to take the natural protein, the alpha hemolysin, which looks a bit like a tube that can insert itself into lipid bilayers. We then had to engineer the insides of the barrel uh, with an adapter molecule that could then recognize each of the four nucleotides uh, and, and give a distinct electrical signal uh, so that we could call the bases. Um, I think it's important to note that, uh, so the work at Oxford University is, is the base calling part. That's the equivalent of perhaps the lasers and the cameras in optical sequencing. There's still a large part of machinery that has to be built onto that nanopore to give what we call an exapore, which is the full piece of sequencing hardware. So your plan is to take uh, DNA exonuclease and snip off individual bases one at a time, correct? That's correct. And in fact, we can routinely build that piece of architecture now in the lab. I think that's an advance over last time we met. Um, we can routinely attach these proteins together. Uh, we can iterate upgrades on the design in sort of two or three day uh, turnaround period and sort of as VP of research what, what I was very keen to do is really accelerate the throughput of experimental progress so we can do about as much work in a day now as we could probably have done in six months previously so there's been a, a huge increase in throughput and then my counterpart Clive Brown uh, has to cope with all that data of course and so we have a sort of a healthy competition between the two of us can I produce more data than he can process? Or is he saying, come on, I can process 10 times more than you're producing? So there's a healthy, healthy competition there, but uh, obviously Clive and I have a lot of history together in, in working on this kind of stuff. You should be able to work that out. Um, is that the long-term plan, to, to snip off bases one at a time? Because when nanopores were first sort of crystallized and this concept was first uh, promulgated, there was an idea of actually moving whole DNA strands through the nanopore, right? Right. So yes, there's these two approaches, either snipping the bases off independently or having, a, having the DNA go through like a piece of rope and calling the bases sequentially. I think it's yet to be proven which one long term is going to be the best way of doing it, but uh, certainly, certainly we are looking at both approaches. And so so short, shorter term, we will go for the, the, the chopping approach first. And your nanopore system could in principle be used for a lot more applications beyond simply DNA sequencing? Right, we can fine-tune the internal barrel of the nanopore really to identify most biomolecules with proteins, sugars, drug molecules. Essentially any molecule that's small enough to go down the barrel we can assign a, a specific signal to and tailor the nanopore to that. So beyond sequencing, diagnostics, uh, defense applications, yes. So uh, just to go back to that uh Nature Nanotech paper where you were able to resolve the four bases plus the methylated bases. I mean, is there much more chemistry that you need to do or is it now just putting the pieces together uh, and then building the system around it? So we now know that all our molecular machinery works. Um, we know all, all the individual components are doing what they should be doing. It's really more a case of now uh, reliable system setup, maximizing the number of wells, the number of channels, optimizing the fluidics. Uh, people become very sort of focused on the hard science, but the reality is that you have to build a, a product that customers can use and it works a thousand times out of a thousand. And it's always the little glitchy things that uh, you know, catch you out in your know, bubbles in your fluidics, etc. Those problems all have to be ironed out and you know, that can take you know, as much effort as the hard science itself. And you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion uh, a deal that Oxford has with Illumina. For people who aren't familiar with that, what, just, you know, what are the parameters of that deal and how is that going to help you going forward? Uh, we don't talk too publicly about a lot of the details of that deal. Uh, I think we've made the statement about how much Illumina have invested in us. But it's a sales and marketing, they're, they're going to help with that side of it. Yes, we, we have no plans to build our own sales and marketing force. Uh, Illumina will do that for us. John, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, good luck, I uh, hope you have fun at the meeting and uh, we look forward to actually hearing you present here one of these days. Thanks Kevin.
Thanks a lot.